Dr. Torpy, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I uh, want to start this evening with a pretty short presentation, uh, just kind of introducing a bit uh, a few terms having to do with migraine and intractable, intractable migraine. We'll review a few treatment uh, options, and then we'll open the uh, open the lines up for questions, which I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation tonight. So starting with the first, uh, first definition, really what is an intractable migraine? So an intractable migraine is, is a migraine which is refractory to the standard standard treatment. And when we talk about standard treatment for migraine, I mean, that includes, you know, a myriad of treatments, including over-the-counter medications, uh, something as simple as Tylenol or ibuprofen, one of the most common medications used for migraine, especially for folks that have episodic migraine that may not seek a headache specialist, uh, would be Excedrin. That's obviously a very common migraine medication. Also, standard treatment for migraines include a class of medications called triptans. And anyone that suffers from migraine certainly is aware of, of triptan medications. The, the first and most popular uh, triptan medication is sumatriptan, which was marketed under the brand name of Imitrex before it became generic. And these medications work by uh, something called vasoconstriction, so they tighten the blood vessels. And that becomes a really important mechanism for treating, treating migraine. But in, in many patients' cases, these standard treatments are, are not effective or they've become un ineffective over time. And that's when the, the person would have what we call an intractable migraine, which, again, is the topic for most of our questions tonight. Uh, next slide, please. Another definition I wanted to review is chronic migraine. And chronic migraine is, is defined as having uh, 15 or more headache days per month for greater than three months. So when someone has chronic migraine, obviously uh, this is greatly impacting their, their ability to function, their ability to, to work, and, and uh, really, really underscores the need for effective treatment, and uh, not just treatment to to alleviate the migraine when it happens, but also uh, medication to prevent the frequency and the severity of their migraine. And we'll review uh, a couple of those treatment options uh, shortly as well. Next slide. And another term I want to review is status migranosis. And this is a condition that's defined as having a severe migraine for greater than 72 hours. Uh, and the other areas of medicine, we, we talk about status epilepticus. That's if someone has an epileptic uh, seizure that lasts uh, you know, a, an extended period of time. Uh, in the case of a migraine, there's status, mi uh, status migranosis. And this is also a condition when someone has become refractory to those standard treatments that are more typical for uh, you know, the average migraine sufferer. The next slide, please. So I'd like to review just uh, a bit about the treatment of status migranosis. And status migranosis, which, which can also be referred to as the intractable migraine, uh, this, can be, this can be addressed both in the outpatient uh, scenario and, and even in the inpatient scenario, even in the emergency department or the, the ER. And really, when, when the doctors and nurses are, are looking at treating status migranosis, there are three main uh, areas w where we would focus. First is medication for the headache and the migraine symptoms, something to try to break this cycle. Because usually by the time someone has sought treatment from the physician or the nurse, nurse practitioner in the emergency department or, or even a you know, physician assistant, uh, they've been suffering from this migraine and this pain and all these other symptoms for usually at least uh, you know, a day or uh, a very severe headache that's maybe less than a day. But typically, there needs to be an initiation of some medication to try to break this cycle. Uh, when we think about a migraine that is just going on and on, we, we really think of it as being in a, a cycle. And the pain receptors in the brain are really communicating with one another that this, uh, this is just a repetitive cycle of, of pain and all the other symptoms. And, and we need to, to break that cycle with medication. Many times, patients that are suffering from migraine and severe migraines, they have very severe nausea and vomiting. And this can, can uh, end up with dehydration. So in the emergency department, many times a migraine patient will have IV fluids to try to correct that dehydration. And then also management of the nausea and vomiting. So we can give medications such as Zofran or Reglan to try to alleviate the, uh, the nausea and vomiting as well. Uh, next slide, please. 
So looking at the different medications that can be used uh, specifically at this point in the outpatient um, arena, medications to break the cycle of, of migraine, one of the most popular medications used to, to break the cycle of migraine are steroids. And there's something called a Medrol dose pack. If anyone has had migraine for quite some time, I'm sure at, at some point or another, they've been exposed to steroids to try to break that cycle. So steroids work to reduce inflammation. They reduce the body's uh, response to things. And uh, there's, a, there's a pack called the Medrol dose pack, which is solumedrol. And it can be given uh, for about five days. And it tends to, to in many cases, uh, break that cycle of migraine. Also, anti-inflammatory medications, such as NSAIDs. So I think most people have heard of ibuprofen or Advil, um, naproxen, or Aleve. These medications can also be used to, uh, to break a cycle if they're dosed appropriately. Muscle relaxants can be used to break a cycle of migraine. Uh, sometimes these can be used in combination with the, the next bullet point, antihistamines. The challenge with using muscle relaxants with antihistamines uh, is that we have to be aware of sedation. Many times antihistamines uh, can be used sort of now and again to, to alleviate a, a severe migraine or to give somebody uh, the ability to be a, just a bit relaxed and sedated uh, to sort of ride out the, the migraine. But in the case of a, a status migraine or an intractable migraine, uh, the combination of a muscle relaxant with an antihistamine could be used together for a finite amount of time, maybe for two, three, four days. Uh, but again, that, at that uh, situation, we'd really have to be careful and we'd be worried about sedation for that particular patient. And then very rarely, uh, opioids can be used. Opioids uh, are very strong pain medications. And we, we do try to avoid using those when possible because they do carry with them the risk of, uh, of addiction and also uh, sedation. So we do try to avoid those when we, when we can. Next slide, please. In the case of very severe migraines, uh, when we, we think about treatment in the inpatient setting, which again, that could include the emergency department or even an inpatient hospital stay, uh, there are several different medications that can be used. And I don't want to get too deeply into all the different specific medications. I want to make sure we have time to, to open the floor for questions. But a variety of IV and intramuscular medications can be used. So uh, when we think about an IV vasoconstrictor, again, earlier I mentioned that the tryptan medications are vasoconstrictors, and they work by tightening the blood vessels. There's a potent vasoconstrictor called dihydroergotamine, and that can be used in the inpatient setting with subsequent doses, and many times that can break the headache cycle, the migraine cycle. Likewise, in the emergency department, in many cases, a single dose of DHE, which is short for dihydroergotamine, again, tightening the blood vessels, that can oftentimes break the, the headache cycle. The IV anti-epileptic class, so this would include uh, the IV form of Depakote, uh, which is, is known as Depakon, valproate sodium, that oftentimes can break a headache cycle as well. Uh, diphenhydramine, which is the uh, generic name for Benadryl, this is oftentimes surprising to people to learn that an IV dose of, of Benadryl and subsequent doses uh, over time of, of an IV dose of Benadryl can actually help break a headache cycle as well. Typically, the oral version of Benadryl, which is available over the counter, typically that does not help with, uh, with migraine. IV forms of anti-inflammatory medications, uh, NSAIDs, uh, which would include Ketorolac and uh, Toradol is the old brand name for that. Uh, that particular um, sort of mechanism is very similar to the over-the-counter versions, which we know, as we talked earlier about, as Advil and Aleve, the ibuprofen and naproxen. But in the IV form, uh, ketorolac can be much stronger and can be more effective at helping to break uh, a headache cycle. IV forms of steroid can also be used, both in the emergency department and in the outpatient setting, to uh, help break a headache cycle. IV muscle relaxants, again, can be also used in an inpatient setting to help break the headache cycle. And also phenothiazines, uh, different uh, medications that are originally, were originally used for psychiatric purposes have been found to be extremely effective uh, for migraine patients as well. And again, rarely opioids. Uh, there are times when a person's uh, pain and, and symptoms are so severe that, yes, they, they have to be treated with opioids. But again, we try to do that uh, as infrequently as possible, both because we want the patient to be able to function as soon as possible, 
but also um, there is the risk of addiction, but also there's a risk of rebound. Opioid, uh, if opioids are dosed too frequently in a given month, they can definitely uh, attribute to a rebound headache phenomenon. Next slide. And this is actually the last slide that I prepared so that we can open things for, for questions. But when we look at migraine prevention therapy, uh, there are certainly non-drug ways to, to prevent uh, migraines, such as uh, acupuncture, biofeedback. Those are very, very important. But when we look just at medications, I, I like to typically say there are three main groups of migraine prevention medications. So anti-epileptics, so the anti-seizure medications very common uh, anti-seizure medicines, Depakote, uh, Topamax, Keppra, uh, those, those are the, the main three that, that we think of with the anti-epileptic medications. And these prevention medications, when we say prevention, it's, it's not uh, usually as robust as a vaccination where we're completely preventing the migraine, but lessening the frequency and lessening the severity of the, of the migraines. Antidepressants, there are many different antidepressants that have uh, a really really good uh, effect on the, on the uh, migraine and are able to, to lessen the severity and the frequency of the migraine. And also antihypertensives or blood pressure medicines. And all of these three, me these three classes can be used independent of what other uh, scenarios may be going on with the patient. For example, if a patient uh, is being treated with an anti-seizure medicine for their migraine prevention, it certainly doesn't mean that they have seizures. That's not why we're prescribing the anti-seizure medicine. Uh, by that same token, if I prescribe an antidepressant for a patient that has migraine, I'm not saying that that patient necessarily has depression. There is often a, uh, an overlap with chronic migraine patients with anxiety and depression, but we know that independent of a person's depression or a person's blood pressure or a person's you know, lack of having seizures, these medications can all be very effective. And again, as I mentioned, the antihypertensives or blood pressure medications. Also, I've listed Botox, so botulinum toxin has been shown and is approved by the FDA for chronic migraine, and Botox can be very, very effective. It's, it's dosed every three months, every 90 days, and uh, it, it can be very, very effective at lessening the frequency and severity of migraine. So those are the, the slides that I wanted to review, I think, just to give a few uh, definitions and to kind of open the discussion for questions, and I'm certainly Happy now to address any questions that you may have. All right. Looks like we have um, a few questions here. Just give me one second. Okay. Our first question looks like it comes from Kirsten. She wants to know if you would recommend the Omega procedure or any other surgical intervention. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a really good question, and there has been a lot of press lately about the uh, Omega procedure and these decompression uh, procedures. The truth is there doesn't seem to be a lot of long-term data for the Omega procedure and, and the decompression surgery procedures. Uh, there does tend to be, uh, for a, a few months, from the data that I've reviewed, a, a couple of months of, of improvement in, in some patients. Uh, 